Operation Barbarossa Operation Barbarossa was the code name for the invasion of the Soviet Union by Nazi Germany and some of its Axis allies. During World War II. It started on June 22, 1941. It was the largest military invasion in human history, with more than 3 million men attacking along an 1800-mile front. The code name was a tribute to Frederick I. A German king and Holy Roman Emperor who had led a crusade to the East in the 12th century. Okay, uh, noise reality is an idea that was set up uh, 15 years ago. Uh, me and my ex, we thought about buying a building in New York and actually doing a conference lecture series, uh, having people uh present arts and other uh different kinds of things and and um this was essentially uh the idea we basically wanted to cover anything uh myself my background is i'm one of the people who created the new york military affairs symposium uh, i also uh have been involved in this field uh going back to the 70s and 60s and the Eastern Front, of course, is to me the most important part of the Second World War to understand in depth. Uh, it's terra incognita. I would also say that understanding the war in Asia and particularly the war in China with Japan is another area which is needing much exploration. However, uh, we will focus in on the uh, first, basically the first month and the road leading to war on June 22nd, 1941. Now we're dealing with the largest military campaign in history. We're dealing with a campaign that has uh, gone through different phases of interpretation historically since the war itself uh, and throughout the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Uh, obviously, most of us uh, were educated on reading the memoirs of Heinz Guderian and others who wrote about the Eastern Front. And we now have uh, due to many scholars, John Erickson comes to mind in England, David Glantz in the United States, the uh, amazing uh, official histories done by the Germans in the past 30 years. We now have a much more nuanced understanding of Operation Barbarossa uh, and the Eastern Front in general. In addition, if we had Jeffrey Megary here today, Jeffrey Megary was the late historian of the Holocaust Museum. Uh, he uh, was somebody who was very much into uh, pioneering the integration of operational military history, particularly as it pertains to the Eastern Front, into the question of the Holocaust, which, uh, as we know, uh, the actual savage reality on the ground for people in the Soviet Union as the Germans advanced was one where they were implementing with great uh, ruthlessness and brutality the uh, ideas of na Nazi racism. Uh, it was only until in the past 20 to 30 years we understand that the Germans had planned Operation Barbarossa on the assumption that they would deliberately starve about 30 to 40 million people. So all these aspects of the war we will explore in the weeks to come. One thing we will do initially is spend a lot of time with dealing with different interpretations of operational history in World War II, uh, and particularly on the Eastern Front. So we're going to be very pleased to have uh, Craig Luther today. Um, he will be giving the bulk of this discussion today based on his marvelous book, looking at the first day of Operation Barbarossa. Alex Stavropoulos is here in New York. He wants to talk for about 10 minutes on logistics. I told him to keep it short, and we'll get to Craig. Um, and we will introduce modules of uh, interpretation and opinion as we go along in looking at the operational history of a war. The next person who will talk will be Robert Carishabel, uh, who did uh, several uh, books on uh, the Eastern Front World War II. He just did a best-selling atlas for Osprey on the Eastern Front, and he's done another atlas on the Blitzkrieg era. But one of the key persons to have us uh, explore this will be David Glantz. Uh, David Glantz, as people know, is one of the most prolific historians in the United States, actually the most prolific on the Eastern Front in World War II. At this point, with John Erickson uh, gone, uh, maybe David Stahill, younger scholars are moving up. Craig, of course, I consider in that category. We have a whole bunch of people 
people coming in who have a better understanding about this situation. Uh, but um, basically, we're in a situation where uh, it is such a rich subject to just look at the first month of the war and the steps leading towards it that I can see us concentrating at least a year on that. Others will bring in discussions about other campaigns, uh, Smolensk, Stalingrad, but uh, and and that's important to bring in. We're not going to delay that. We need to broaden it out. But the concentration will be on the initial two months of the war, June, July, August 1941. Uh, and then we'll move on and integrate other aspects of it. But the Battle of Smolensk, the Kiev encirclements, uh, Operation Typhoon, the Battle of Moscow, etc. Uh, so with that being said, uh, I wanted to, first of all, mention uh, who we're doing these series in honor of uh, and in memory of. And that is the late uh, scholar John Prados, who was a good friend of us in New York and is a good friend of the whole military history community. Uh, I'm showing some of the obituaries that were given to John when he died uh, last year. Uh, he produced, uh, those of you in the wargaming community know that uh, his game, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, was a best, big bestseller, uh, sold 300,000 copies. Uh, John did many war games, but he also was a dedicated scholar of the Cold War and World War II. Uh, uh, he basically was a military historian. And he basically, I, I could give you assorted stories of John, um, since we knew each other quite well, starting from 1972 on. Uh, but uh, he, of course, if he was alive, we'd want John to be part of this process. So, uh, uh, And John, of course, was in favor of an eclectic, interdisciplinary approach to military history. Uh, now, one of the things that some of our colleagues in the uh, other subdisciplines of history, they tend to view talking about operational history as, I guess, the equivalent of, you know, tying down a fundamentalist Christian and making him watch Pornhub uh, constantly. Uh, that is the approach that, you know, I think has led to a lot of misconceptions and misinterpretations of what goes on. I've been to constant historical conferences in the past 30 years where basically the people in there talking about the Eastern Front They'll talk about anything but the war itself. So while one has to guard against over emphasis, I think of the great book that Ronald Smeltzer and Stephen Davies did about the mythologization of the Eastern Front in American and Western culture. I'm going to try to track them down. I haven't talked to them. They work at the University of Utah. They both have retired and I want to include them in the mix. Uh, I think it's important for us to keep in mind that, you know, we have a modern concept of the war in, in eastern in the eastern front and it's certainly one and as i said as i started this before we actually got on the stream uh you know we are de facto in a war with russia right now uh and people have very different interpretations of it uh, it's obviously going to be a major issue in the presidential campaign so it's also i think a public service to uh try to understand and explain to the public something that most americans they think of world war ii they think of pearl harbor uh, D-Day and dropping the bomb and that's it. Uh, and of course we all know as students of Second World War it's much more than that. So we, what we're going to do today is we're going to do two, several phases. Uh, the first phase will be Alex Stavropoulos talking for about 10 minutes about logistics on the Eastern Front. I'm going to keep him to that uh, because we're really excited to have Craig Luther come and talk about his work on the Eastern Front. Now Craig can introduce himself uh, Craig, of course, did the first is really a really brilliant book. Um, I felt it should have gotten uh, awards uh, when it was published. And this is, of course, uh, his book, The First Day on the Eastern Front, a brilliant tour de force, uh, which I learned a lot from when I read. It. I remember I picked it up in a Barnes and Noble and on the east side in Manhattan. I said, who did this book? I said to myself when I picked it up, it was such a, a really good book. And um and again, remember, I, uh, when I was younger, um, I had the great privilege and fortune to listen to German veterans of the Second World War in a uh, multi-day conference in southern Germany and Bavaria talk about Operation Barbarossa. They were all Schnell officers, by the way. They're all Panzer officers. So it was quite an experience. Um, and, um, and so I was very impressed to see somebody had taken all the work that's been done for many years. And uh, Craig, of course, is influenced by the work of David Glantz and others. And uh, just did such a superb job. So we're looking forward to hearing Craig talk 
about this. We also have a movie. Uh, I've never done a, a, a military history talk where somebody's actually designed a movie for us. So before Fred talk, uh, before uh, Craig talks, we're going to play uh, a little four minute uh, film that was just done for this series in particular. And I want to thank uh, Fred Cottrell, a military 45. Craig can later get into that uh, in detail. But um, without further ado, Alex, I want you to uh, take the screen and give us your little pressy on logistics. Now, remember, everybody wait until later to talk uh, and discuss things about what we're going to talk about today, because I know everybody has a lot to say and wants to contribute. So just sort of, you know, keep it under control. We'll have plenty of time for conversation later and comments and ideas to be expressed. So go on, Alex. Alex Davaropoulos. Uh, you, guys, you guys are all seeing this, right? Uh, half track pulling a gun and all that. Okay. Yeah. So again, I'll run through this very quickly because again, June doesn't want us to spend too much time. But I thought I'd give us a kind of outline of um, some of the you know latest um, historiography on again the logistics, which I think is the chief constraint determining um, you know what happened with the Eastern Front and in the first six months. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, wait, okay, there we go. Okay. So one of the first things um, to focus on is the importance of rail transport. Again, um, which we kind of see with um, the current war in Ukraine, just how important rail is um, in Eastern Europe to basically it's the way that the vast majority of tonnage is transported around for you know military supplies and but also you know equipment and so on. So of course <laughs> one of the classic things everybody remembers is the different rail gauges. You know the Soviets deliberately having a different rail gauge from um, Central and Western Europe. So that meant that the Germans had to basically repair the entire rail network as they moved east with the resulting constraint on um, their logistics. Of course the Soviets um, you know did their best to destroy rails, to tear them up, to, um, <laughs> and um, if you read again the various plans, you know, uh, through 40, 1940, um, for Barbarossa, uh, there's a lot of assumptions in them about the capture intact of, you know, rail equipment and rail lines, that especially again, railing stock and locomotives uh, from the Soviets would be captured and could be used. Um, Again, one other factor to remember here is again, Soviet locomotives were much bigger. Um, they uh, you know, could pull more and they could get, move for longer distances. So again, literally basically the Germans move east and repair these, you know, replace the rails. They have to build double, almost double the number of service stations. And of course, again, they're you know, kind of lighter, less heavy trains can pull less. So um, also again, there's a big issue again with the Einsatztruppe, the railroad troops which again, have a very limited amount of manpower and equipment. So they can't do what they could um, if they had been properly basically uh, manned up. Again, when rebuilding again, the whole ro Russian rail network, there's a whole you know, other series of things that the Germans had to do, tr building train sheds, repair facilities, turntables, water towers, et cetera, and all the heavy equipment behind it that <laughs> required you know, transporting that. And having again trained personnel, which again the Einsatz, as I said, the Einsatz, ice and bond trooper were inadequate in the first place. Okay, um, this is also a result of decisions that the Germans had made back in 1939 that rail was going to be less important. Again, they could focus more on the motorized uh, transport. So again, they are basically manufacturing back at home less rolling stock and locomotives themselves. <coughs> also, there's a jurisdictional thing between um, the Army Quartermaster General Edward Wagner, Wagner and uh, Lieutenant General Rudolf Gerke, who's the head of uh, transport, of Wehrmacht transport. So again, one is subordinate to OKW, one to OKH. So there's conflicting uh, jurisdiction there. Um, and again, so yeah, so Wagner could tell, you know, Gerke, okay, you got to send this there, but he couldn't order him to do so. Um, and they had to kind of collaborate and, you know, through OKH and OKW staff separately in order to, you know, prioritize, say, one army group over another in terms of transport. Uh, of course, as we know, again, you know, um, at the beginning of the campaign, well, and going up to, 
Uh, the Germans had concentrated their motorized vehicles in the Panzer Force. Uh, each uh, infantry division only had 942 vehicles, we're including motorcycles here, but 1,200 horse-drawn wagons. Again, for the overall Wehrmacht, there were only three transport regiments, 9,000 men total, 6,600 vehicles, and that force could deliver only 19,500 tons of uh, supplies, again, over rather limited different, uh, distances. Also, there's the different kinds of vehicles, 2,000 different types. They literally had in their stocks 1 million uh, spare parts alone. There we go. Okay. Uh, so again, here, of course, we have a nice photo of a wrecked, uh, probably Soviet train. Again, actually might have been sabotaged because, again, um, you know, it would have been hit and then thrown off the side. Probably, again, this is something the Soviets did themselves. Again, you have the German troops marching down this railroad. Okay, <laughs> so again, going back to vehicles, there had been a, pr a shell program to try and standardize vehicles, but it didn't work. Again, there's no uh, German equivalent to the Studebaker, a kind of, you know, one or, or a Jeep, you know. There are so many different kinds of civilian vehicles involved here. They, for the campaign, they put in, dragged in 13,000 French trucks. Also, again, this is interesting, three to 4,000 trucks from North Africa. Um, again, a lot of the trucks two wheel drive, uh, units in the early months of the campaign suffered 50% losses, again, from you know, maintenance issues, and production could not replace that. Again, um, in February 40, there were 120,000 trucks in the Army, and they already had a shortfall of over 2,000. Again, they're losing 2,400 a month to that. And again, their production is 4,000 a month, um, especially because of rubber shortages which again, Ted can talk about since he's the J Japanese guy again, um, <clears throat> they're trying to get at the beginning of the war, 25,000 tons of rubber that they had ordered from French Indochina, but <laughs> the Japanese weren't letting that go through. Um, <clears throat> and again, because of <clears throat> excuse me, limited uh, German ability to process rubber, even though I think they're making something like 12, 15, uh, th 12,000 tons of rubber a month, or well, had it, um, <clears throat> they could only make, you know, 7,300 tons for like, you know, tires and such. Again, they considered requisitioning a number of civilian trucks. And to give you an idea of just one unit, 18th Panzer Division had 111 different types of trucks, 96 different types of personnel carriers, 27 different kinds of motorcycles. Um, and this is, again is with Halder basically cutting back on the number of vehicles before Barbarossa in order basically to kind of reduce the... Yeah, um, all right, again, of course, we know about the horse-drawn wagons being increasingly important, added to the TONE of units. Uh, the infantry divisions were going to rely on 50,000, so the integral transport capacity for the different army groups was 12,750 for AG North Center, 25,000. Army Group South, a little over, well, a little under 16,000. So, uh, okay, existing tr tr trucks available to each motorized division could only deliver 70 tons of supplies a day when they needed 300 tons of supplies a day. So you do the math on that one. Okay, we'll see again the typical kind of, um, to have 100, uh, the primary supply dump, 100 kilometers in from the, you know, Soviet-German border, then developing a secondary supply dump 300 kilometers so 400 kilometers total in. Okay, and here, of course, again, is one of the famous photos of, again, showing uh, it, it dust the, all the vehicles. And you can see the different um, characterization here in just, again, what, okay. So again, yeah, General George Thomas, who's the Chief of Defense Economy and Armaments Office in the OKW, and again, does a lot of the planning again. He had told um, Alder in the high, high command, fuel supplies will be exhausted by the autumn, aviation one quarter, diesel and heating oil will be one half. So again, this is where again, kind of Hitler's economic directives capture again, the Donetsk, Krasnodar, the Caucasus of course, but even Galicia had oil fields that they wanted. Um, and here again is another thing going back to the railroad issue, which is that again, Germany had plenty of coal. Again, remember of course they, they were, would make artificial oil from coal eventually to kind of meet their needs later on in the war. So by relying more on the rails, 
Um, that also would have meant less using less oil, less motorized transport, <laughs> and would have alleviated a lot of the fuel problems, which again, as we you know get into the details of the early months of the operation, will become huge. So again, that would have been less wear and tear too. Okay, um, again, you can see, well, I'll show a photo in a minute, that <laughs> you have German tanks literally pulling two-wheeled trailers behind them with 200-liter uh, petrol cans and other fuel cans strapped to their turrets. Uh, okay, so again, according to General Thomas on the logistics, you guys does the, a lot of the logistics planning. He said the advance could be, initial advance would be 700 to 800 kilometers, would allow for two to three months of active operations, and then you would have need an operational pause, which again, uh, kind of coincidentally comes at Smolensk in, you know, in uh, August, September. Okay, also in terms of fuel, we have an issue of Soviets using lower octane oil that, you know, gas, that couldn't really be used in German vehicles. It would wreck them. So they had to be like refrost essentially and then used. So captured fuel stocks, unlike in Western Europe, where the Germans, you know, really took advantage in say like France and the low countries, um, they couldn't do that. Of course, again, we know about the roads, only 40,000 of the more than 800,000 miles of road in the USSR were, you know, not properly serviced all weather roads like they would probably see mostly in Western and Central Europe. So again, the wear and tear, of course, is gonna be much worse. Um, so again, we have a quote from Halder, I refuse to allow economic considerations to influence operational direction. Uh, of course, again, we know about the Germans then going to living off the land and then necessitates the hunger plan, which again, uh, General Thomas himself actually did. And um, I, one interesting question for me, again, is, I haven't heard anything about him. I mean, he should have, since he did the hunger plan, he probably should have been brought up in war crimes, but I think he died pretty early in 1946. So maybe they never just uh, got around to charging him, uh, you know, the Nuremberg cases. Uh, but of course, again, we could uh, say that all this dri helped drive the Soviet people into the arms of Stalin and, you know, makes it, uh, you know, war where the Germans aren't going to get the kind of support that they hope from, you know, that, or that the Soviet people would not fight for Stalin. Okay, so here, of course, is a German tanker, period. And again, here, here are some photos, again, showing, yeah, jerry cans, but also, again, uh, <coughs> here, yeah, attached here on, again, I guess these are, yeah, Panzer, I think these are Panzer twos. But again, here with uh, Stugs, and yeah, you can see this, uh, yeah, I think it's Panzer three. Okay, so one last thing I thought I'd throw in here, again, is the issue of the Balkans, um, which also has effects on logistics. Um, again, Glantz himself has argued uh, we can ask him when he comes on that Balkans operations didn't really delay things uh, that basically the mid, you know, to late June date was always in the plan. Um, the, while again, the operation Yugoslavia did not wind up using too many divisions. Again, uh, about two thirds of the divisions were placed from OKH reserves. Um, the invasion of Greece did start again to take away a significant number of divisions that needed to be used for occupation duties there. Um, and because of the distance is going to cost poor, poor uh, roads in um, Greece, in that part of the Balkans, <coughs> maintenance losses for that part of the operations was more important. Uh, so again, the divisions that had sent for Barbarossa uh, had to go all the way back to Germany to refit and get this basically a tire core, you can see here, second, fifth Panzer and 60th motorized um, had to be could not be sent until October 41. So obviously for Operation Typhoon. Also, there was the loss of 220 transport aircraft and 4,000 elite airborne troops for the invasion of Crete. Um, and of course, the Balkan operations general, though also again, you know, with the need for occupation troops in Yugoslavia and Greece, that deepens the overextension of the Wehrmacht. So that's a kind of underlying thing um, there. So again, I'll be almost done here. So I just want to end with three que big questions that I want, um, again, based on the logistical constraints that I've described here. So do, does all of this mean that basically Barbarossa could not lead to victory in 1941 regardless? Of, well, again, once we assume that, you know, the Russians, Soviets aren't going to collapse and that, yeah, they're not going to go over to the Germans, you know, once, well, once things like the commissar order 
uh, turn not just the Soviet people, but the Soviet army completely again, you know, in a war to the death um, with the Germans. So again, that leads to the second kind of related question, is it a doomed operation from the beginning in general? Was it, you know, and again, as I've read more of like, well, not just David Glantz, but also um, David Stahill in particular, I've come more to that point of view, that the answer to that is yes, that it was a hope that the Germans could not win. And that, yeah, the USSR just, in, given the circumstances of how they did the invasion, it was just too big for the Wehrmacht to conquer. All right, everyone, so I hope that's uh, given you some food for thought. And I guess we'll now turn it over to Craig. The um, film that was done by uh, uh, Fred Cottrell, uh, uh, Craig, do you want to make a comment on it? The video is by a gentleman named Frederick Contarell, who has a terrific website uh, or YouTube channel dedicated to doing videos on Operation Barbarossa. It's called military1945.com. And he and I recently produced a series of 12 uh, uh, videos, on uh, short but very graphic videos on Operation, Operation Barbarossa, Barbarossa using the text from the book that I completed in 2020 or was published then, uh, the book that I did with uh, David Stahill, uh, Soldiers of Barbarossa, what's it called? Uh, um, Combat, Genocide, and Everyday Experiences on the Eastern Front, June to December 1941. We used the text, uh, various uh, uh, letters and diary entries from that, and um, then Frederick went and found footage from his incredible uh, uh, archive of uh, almost 6,000 different uh uh, 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 pieces of, of footage, most of which he's gotten from like uh, private sources. So it's not the kind of stock footage that you, you're going to say, oh yeah, I've, I've seen that a hundred times. Most of it will be uh, very, very new to you. But he uh, kindly put together this little video showing uh, kind of what the start of Barbarossa uh, must have looked like to, to a lot of folks along uh, the, the three million Germans lined up along a 1,200 kilometer front. So Jim, uh, uh, take it away with, I think it's uh, three minutes and 46 seconds. So go ahead and take it away. Video showing uh, kind of what the start of Barbarossa uh, must have looked like to, to, to a lot of folks, folks along uh, the, the three million Germans lined up along a 1,200 kilometer front. So Jim, uh, uh, take it away with, I think it's uh, three minutes and 46 seconds. So go ahead and take it away. And there's no audio, just the... Uh, just, yeah, just, just the just video, video of, of, of German, German troops, troops uh, moving, moving up to the front, the front on, on the, the uh, eve of, of uh, Barbarossa. And then you'll, and see, you'll see amazing, amazing footage, footage of the, of the start Soviet of the artillery, artillery fire, fire and, and naval and Gaffa, Gaffa, rocket, rocket launchers, launchers and so, so forth. forth. <clears throat> The Heinkel 111s and Stukas. For the entire campaign, the Germans only had uh, 323 Stukas uh, along the main part of the Eastern Front and virtually or all of them, I think, with Army Group Center. Soldiers marching through dust, an, an iconic image of uh, the Barbarossa campaign. <clears throat> the actual attack began just shortly after 3 a.m. in the morning on Sunday, the 22nd of June.
And this is probably from one of the uh, Wolkenschau uh, weekly news reels. news reels. And this and is the uh, um, proclamation, the very, very long-winded proclamation long Hitler made to his soldiers, soldiers just hours before the campaign, campaign began. began. And here it goes. Here it goes. Those are most likely 150 millimeter, 15 centimeter naval air for rocket launchers. And of course, a, a river crossing uh, in the area of Army Group Center. Uh, the border was, uh, I think, completely along the, uh, uh, they attacked along roughly a 500 kilometer front and the border was uh, along the uh, Bug River. Here we can see it's focusing in on um, some of the forces of uh, on the, the left wing of uh, Army Group Center, uh, the 39th Panzer Corps, for example, uh, the 6th Infantry Corps. And I think that's uh, pretty much the end of it. And then a little plug for our Soldiers of Barbarossa videos. That that all good, y'all? You, you get you, you folks uh, hearing me? Yeah, you're better now, okay, Craig. Thanks, I'm thanks. Getting, so. the, I'm getting the feedback. Unfortunately, now isn't this great? Now I can't hear any of you. <laughs> but uh, Alex, Alex, I just saw you cough. Yeah, yeah. If you can hear me, raise your finger. Okay. Okay, uh, Dave, you might want to yeah put the start the the this share screen so. Before I, I begin with my little talk, can I uh, make a couple comments about Alex's uh, talk on logistics? Please do. Okay, okay. Um, first of all, that was a, a great report, uh, very detailed. Um, like everything else, the Germans, uh, their, their, their logistical planners, just like the operational planners, made um, very rosy assumptions about how the campaign was going to proceed, and they had no plan B. German logistics were basically um, uh, tailored, and, the, and they had enough resources to, to essentially um, sustain the German advance about 500 kilometers into the interior of Soviet Russia, that is about to the, the Dnieper and Western Davina river lines. Uh, after that, they would have to rely on um, <clears throat> much more on the Russian rail lines. The, the Germans had hoped, because of the surprise nature of their attack, uh, that, they were, that they would capture most of the um, Russian stock and a lot of their larger locomotives intact. That did not happen. Uh, when the Russians withdrew, they were able a, either either able to uh, uh, pull pull the uh, uh, the Güterwagen, the freight wagons, and the the locks, the, the locomotives back with them, or to destroy them. And so the Germans had to, um, uh, you know, they had the, these these uh, Eisenbahn uh, Truppen railroad troops that Alex talked about that um, were able to change uh, on a good day about 20 kilometers a day. They could um, uh, change to the German and Western European gauge, which I believe was either nine, uh, nine centimeters larger or nine centimeters narrower than the uh, Russian gauge. Um, but the Germans didn't have enough troops to, to really do that at, at, uh, ex expeditiously enough. I don't even think they were, were motorized. Um, the other comment I wanted to make is um, uh, David Glanz is absolutely correct. Uh, for years, the, the conventional wisdom has been that uh, the Balkan campaign held up 
the German advance into Russia by, by four or five weeks. That is simply not true. The Balkan campaign did have a, 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 a deleterious impact on, on army group south. Uh, it forced them to replace the larger 12th army, which had been earmarked for Barbarossa, which the much smaller 11th army, and they lost the second and fifth panzer divisions, which had gotten pretty torn up, um, um, not through losses in combat, but just driving on the terrible roads in the Balkans. They, they needed to be returned to Germany for maintenance and they, and they wouldn't be committed to the Eastern Front uh, until September, shortly before the start of uh, Operation Typhoon and the advance on Moscow. <clears throat> so, so Army Group South was, was considerably weaker than it should have been because the 11th Army only had like six uh, infantry divisions handful of assault guns. They had no, um, no, no panzer uh, units. Um, and the other thing is the spring of 1941 had been inordinately wet. And the, um, the banks of, of, of the Bug River, for example, opposite both Army Group Center and Army Group South, were just much to the rivers were were swollen, the banks were over you know were covered with uh, uh, inundated with water, and it took weeks uh, into about the fifteenth of June for for the banks to become dry enough and that water to recede enough for the attack to begin, and I even in in my book Barbarossa Unleashed. Uh, I have records of a German officer uh, in the in, in the fourth uh, fourth army, uh, Field Marshal of von Kluge's fourth army, who was actually tracking how the water was receding. You know, from the beginning of June on. Well, it dropped ten centimeters today, another ten centimeters, so on and so forth. So there is no way that the attack could have begun until it could have begun until about the. 15th of June at the uh, <clears throat> at the earliest. So now if everyone can hear me, David, can I get a thumbs up? Super. I'll go ahead with my little talk and excuse my voice. Uh, I uh, blew out my vocal cords recently uh, trying to sing. Uh, I used to be a singer and trying to sing a, uh, a blues song and um, I, I, I normally get a steroid shot. I mean, excuse me, I normally take a couple of uh, light steroids for my allergies in the spring. This time I couldn't do that uh, because uh, the cost had gone up dramatically. So my doctor gave me a steroid shot. Well, that opened up my lungs tremendously. Uh, I haven't been able to sing since pretty much my late fifties because my asthma has returned. But the steroid shot dramatically opened up my lungs. I felt 20 or 30 years younger. So I started singing in my office at the top of my lungs. My, my, my wife could hear it all the way out in our barn, uh, feeding the horses uh, and singing at the top of my lungs for four or five days. Then the steroid shot wore off and my vocal cords have never come back <laughs> entirely. So, so excuse the uh, roughness in my voice. What I had initially planned to do was to just wing it. Uh, I like to talk extemporaneously because it, it allows for an element of spontaneity, which I really enjoy. Uh, so, so normally now when I give a talk, uh, I may have a few notes, a few bullet points, and I just let it roll, and, and, and I like the spontaneity, and it's more fun for me. But get, when I thought about this, I thought, well, uh, I don't have a lot of time to prepare, um, so I thought to take a more structured approach, and I also thought, instead of beginning, as I had initially planned, with, with the, uh, as, as folks like to say, with the, the, the kinetic uh, aspects of the campaign, in other words, the 22nd of June, that what I should do is go back 
and in a structured fashion and read uh, a, a little bit from a lecture I gave at um, uh, UC Santa Barbara and San Jose State and um, back at the uh, Marine Corps University and National Defense University some years back. And in the first uh, part of this uh, lecture, I talk about the origins of Operation Barbarossa. So if you'll forgive me, I'm just gonna read this and occasionally um, may, uh, throw in uh, an additional point to kind of add a, a little spontaneity to it. Uh, you shouldn't have to worry about me bloviating much more than like 20 minutes or so. So I will, I will get started. Okay, Operation Barbarossa, Adolf Hitler's surprise attack on Soviet Russia in the summer of 1941, and the four-year war between Germany and Russia it unleashed was, by virtue of any yardstick, the greatest, most horrific military campaign the world has ever seen. According to noted British historian Paul Johnson, Sunday, 22 June, 1941, the day Barbarossa began was the most significant day of the 20th century. The beginning of a quote, voyage into darkness and the far, farthest reaches of hell, unquote, to borrow from a recent documentary on a related topic. I will also point out that um, in his uh, history of the 20th century, uh, the late Paul Johnson, I believe he died just a few years ago, he also pointed out that the Barbarossa campaign from the very beginning was very much underpowered. In other words, the didn't Germans in their force structure, their logistics, whatever, did not have enough of anything, men, guns, tanks, fuel, uh, whatever. So that's another point he makes. So continuing, the world historical and existential clash between Germany and Soviet Russia literally altered the arc of human history. For example, it witnessed the beginning of the final solution against European Jewry, which culminated in creation of the state of Israel, and it ended with the Soviet advance into the heart of Europe and its division into two competing and ideologically antagonistic blocks, culminating in a Cold War that continued for 45 years. It was without question, one of the most barbaric and perhaps the most costly, I think clearly it was the most costly conflict in recorded history. As renowned English military historian, the late John Keegan keenly observed the frontier battles were quote, fought with a brutality and ruthlessness, ruthlessness not yet displayed in the Second World War, perhaps not seen in Europe since the struggle between Christians and Muslims in the Ottoman Wars of the 16th century, unquote. The war lasted 1,418 days. Over 4 million German soldiers, actually probably closer to 4.5, 4.6 million, and as many as 27 million Russians, soldiers and civilians alike, would perish in the meat grinder that was the Russian front. Uh, I will point out in this context, for decades, the conventional wisdom has been that the Russians lost about 7.5 million soldiers as irrecoverable losses in most vast majority uh, killed in combat, died from disease or wounds, what have you. And the rest, about 20 million were civilians. Recently, a couple of years ago, um, two uh, Russian authors, I can't think of their names. One I believe was an engineer, but they got into a part of the Russian archives that no one had seen and saw a, uh, came up with a, a lot of new data, which has even been uh, uh, confirmed by, by uh, David Glanz, who, who wrote an introduction to their book but the actual number of, of Russian or Red Army war dead was probably more like 14 and a half million. In other words, um, the 27, 28 million Russian dead were almost evenly split. 
between soldiers and civilians. And, and roughly 5 million of those dead Russian civilians were folk like, like uh, maybe the Don Cossacks, the, the uh, um, uh, Volga Germans, the Tartars of Crimea, and, and other ethnic groups which were yanked out of the places they lived and sent on treks to Siberia and other areas and, and died as a result of, of Stalin's policies. Um, so what we have here is the Russian people, if, if you can even wrap your brain around this, lost an average of almost 20,000 human beings per day for nearly four years. By comparison, in Afghanistan and Iraq combined since 2001, uh, US forces have suffered less than 10,000 fatalities. And that was of course, as of about 2014, and it hasn't changed much since then. Uh, although the Soviet Union emerged victorious and built a large empire in Eastern Europe, which lasted for nearly five decades, it never really recovered from the overall effects of the war, demographically, economically, politically, by any measure. Thus, as odd as it may seem, the destruction wrought by the soldiers of Hitler's Wehrmacht, an SS, I should say, uh, actually set the stage for the long and, and inexorable decline and eventual collapse of the Soviet Union 50 years later. Now a little bit on the strategic background and preparation for the campaign. And here, I think we need to briefly examine the, the uh, geopolitical situation in, in Europe that existed after the fall of France in June, 1940. The German victory over France literally shocked the world. Hitler's armies were able to accomplish in literally 42 days what the armies of Imperial Germany had been unable to do in four years between 1914 and 1918. Adolf Hitler was now at the pinnacle of his power and popularity in Germany, which dominated the European continent from Norway to the Pyrenees Mountains. The Fuhrer was certainly the quote, man of the hour, unquote, and everyone awaited his next move. In July, 1940, Hitler unleashed his Luftwaffe in an effort to bring a defiant England to her knees, or at very least to establish the prerequisite for an air superior, of air superiority for a planned invasion of England, Operation Sea Lion. However, by September, 1940, it was clear that the air campaign over England had failed, even though it would continue at, at obviously a lesser pace through the winter of 4041. And the failure of the air campaign in turn compelled Hitler to drop his plans for Sea Lion. And as I said, he never really had his heart in Operation Sea Lion. And, and that, that's a whole other thing don't want to get down into the weeds on that. But as a consequence, by the fall of 1940, he faced a major strategic dilemma. Just how was he to maintain the strategic initiative, what the Germans call, quote, das Gesetz des Handels, unquote. For Hitler knew only too well to forfeit the momentum to stagnate was to court almost inevitable defeat in the years of he ahead when the sea and naval power of Britain and America came into play along with the rapidly expanding military might of Hitler's Russia. Hitler needed to act and to act quickly. And I might add here that major Russian buildup had actually began in the early, early 1930s but it really took off in 1937. And I don't remember the number, but in, in the last 15 months or so before the beginning of, of Barbarossa, it's just mind boggling how many new armies 
the the uh, Red Army was able to add to its force structure. Uh, the problem was they weren't. Many of these new armies and divisions were clearly not properly trained and not properly equipped. You had uh, uh, captains who perhaps should have been commanding a, a battalion, commanding brigades. You had uh, 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 colonels who should have been commanding a regiment, commanding um, a division, so on and so forth. So that massive expansion actually created significant problems for the Red Army on the eve of Barbarossa. But in any case, in getting back to uh, the summer and fall of 1940, Hitler's initial moves involved several diplomatic demarches, most importantly with Franco Spain and Vichy France in an effort to shepherd both parties in a continental block with Germany aimed at England. But these initiatives fell flat. That said, it is certainly true. Once again, Hitler's heart was never really in them. I think it was more Admiral Raider, the commander of the Navy, who, uh, who proposed that idea, was the biggest proponent at, of it. Um, in any case, immediately after the collapse of France, he was looking to the east. Indeed, he asked his army high command to, to he actually asked them to propose the possibility of attacking Russia in the fall of 1940. Of course, that was a, a crazy idea that was uh, quickly smashed by his generals as utterly impractical. In any case, he asked his high command to begin planning for an attack on the Soviet Union with all preparations to be completed by May 1941. Now, Hitler's proximate reason for moving against Mush Russia that emer thus emerged organically, if you will, from the geostrategic calculus that existed from late 1940 on. He had no way at that time to bring England to her knees. And he was certain that by 1942, the very latest, he would also be fighting America. And of course, Russia's burgeoning military power loomed to the east. To withstand the force majeure of Anglo-American sea and naval power, there was only one option available to him. That was to move against Russia militarily mm -hmm. in 1941 before she was ready to move herself, to subdue Russia, rape her of her resources, the grain in the Ukraine, coal in the Donbass, the oil in the Caucasus. And by ruthlessly exploiting these resources, along with those of Western Europe, Hitler hoped to establish a firm autarkic basis of economic power on the European continent from the English Channel to the, to the Urals, from which to challenge his remaining adversaries in a final global struggle for Weltmacht, world power. And here we get to the idea that had been kind of pioneered by the late great uh, German historian, Andreas Hillgruber of Hitler's Stufen plan, or literally plan of, uh, you know, the first level was to conquer uh, Western Europe and Poland, the second level was to settle with, um, with Russia, uh, gain uh, economic uh, autarky, self-sufficiency on the European continent, then in the final phase, move against Anglo-American sea powers. Yet there were other reasons as, as well that Hitler wanted to settle once and for all with the Bolshevik enemy to the east. These reasons derive from what can be called Hitler's programmatic views. You might also say his ideological views. These were formed in the 1920s, laid down in his book, Mein Kampf. And of course, they included Hitler's call for Lebensraum, living space in the East, which was needed, so we thought, to accommodate the large growth in the German population since the late 19th century. In other words, Germany 
needed land in the east to survive. And I'll also point out here, literally a couple of weeks after he became chancellor on the 30th of June, 1933, Hitler met secretly with his generals and basically spilled the beans, basically laid it all out that his ultimate plan was to gain uh, zo oder zo, as the Germans might say, by any means possible, and of course, mostly military means, living space in the East. So he had made that clear to his high command very, very early, from, from the very beginning. Moreover, the Bolshevik Jewish enemy represented by communist Russia posed a mortal threat to Germany. Here we see the tendency to conflate the dangers posed by Bolshevism with the putative existential threat posed by world jewelry. Jew jewelry. Um, yeah, that reminds me, not jewelry. I don't know if you'll recall, there was a uh, uh, SNL skit years ago where some they had this newscaster, they invited some woman on and she made some speech about world jewelry. And eventually the newscaster had to tell her, no, no, uh, my dear, we're talking about jewelry, jewelry not jewelry. But uh, anyway, I'll keep going. A little bit on the German planning. Uh, at Hitler's direction, German planning for Barbarossa began in the summer, basically began in, in July of, of 1940 and was conducted largely by the Army High Command. There were a number of operational studies in the following months. Uh, the major one was conducted by General uh, Eric Marx, who I think at the time was Chief of Staff of the 18th Army. Uh, 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 General uh, Franz Halder, the Chief of the German General Staff, but brought General Marx in to uh, uh, work out a more detailed concept for the campaign. Of course, in the process, incorporating all of Halder's operational concepts, and it only took Eric Marx a couple of weeks to work that out. And on the 5th of December, the German war plan uh, for Barbarossa, uh, and of course it was Hitler who gave that name to the campaign and harkened back to Friedrich Barbarossa and I don't know, I think it was the 13th century, and his uh, ill-fated campaign uh, crusade in, in, in the uh, uh, Middle East. Um, but uh, on, on, on the 5th of December, they briefed the plan to Hitler and Hitler was pretty much uh, uh, down with it all, except he made it clear that he considered Moscow essentially not even a secondary, but a tertiary objective he wanted to capture the Ukraine and, and its grain, uh, the, the, the coal and other minerals of the Donbass and, and uh, capture the, the Baltic states in the north, the port of Kronstadt, uh, 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 Leningrad and, and so forth. And this issue was never ultimately resolved. Uh, and we'll of course get to the implications of that later on, but the German army high command uh, Brockage and Halder essentially just let that go, uh, that issue go, at, and so that issue was never really resolved. But uh, before getting into a little bit of the details in the planning, I'd like to address the reaction of Hitler's general generals to Hitler's decision to move against Russia. Simply put, only a brave few protested. Panzer General Heinz Guderian was at first a very severe critic of the plan, but in the months and weeks ahead, he would openly abandon his opposition. In fact, by the time uh, Barbarossa began, he had become uh, a very enthusiastic proponent. Yet the lack of resistance from Hitler's generals is understandable. After the fall of France, Hitler was at the pinnacle of power and simply too strong to resist. And if some felt ambivalent at best about the decision, others supported it strongly. Yet here's the vital point. Almost none of Hitler's generals believed that Russia would make for a formidable adversary. And that reminds me of a quote 
from Talleyrand, uh, I guess, uh, Napoleon's uh, advisor, uh, who said to Napoleon uh, before he attacked Russia, um, what's the quote? Russia is never as weak as she seems, and Russia is never as strong as she looks, something to that effect. And that is um, kind of kind of amb ambivalent and contradictory, but um, that's pretty much how, how the Germans felt and how Hitler felt. Uh, he would go back and forth in his thinking. And, and some of this came out in comments he made to his secretaries just before the very start of the campaign that, that um, on the one hand, he felt that, that Russia was like a putty. It was like clay that was just going to melt and collapse when the Germans attacked. And at other times, he would admit that we really don't understand, you know, once we kick in the door, what we're going to find behind it. Okay, a little bit about general staff preparations. Uh, in any case, they were based on a fatal underestimation of the Russian enemy. The Germans had not been impressed by the Russian performance in Poland in September 39, and even less so by the protracted and costly war with Finland in 39-40. That said, the historical German perception of Russia, the so-called Ruslan build of Germany's civilian and military leadership was highly conflicted from the late 19th century on. Simply put, they greatly feared the rapid demographic growth of Slavic Russia and endured nightmares of being overrun by Soviet hordes. At the same time, they tended to smear at the actual capabilities of Russian or Soviet forces in the field, which kind of harkens back to the quote by uh, Talleyrand. <clears throat> and uh, well, let me try and speed this up a, a little bit because um, I don't want to take too much more time here. But the crux of the German operational plan was to, with, with strong armored pincers, to surround and annihilate the bulk of Soviet forces west of the Deneva, Dnieper and Western Davina River lines. Now remember that harkens back to Alex's discussion about logistics because um, the Germans were prepared for a campaign that carried them about 500 kilometers inside the Soviet Union. After that, if, if the Soviet Union, if the state didn't collapse and the Red Army didn't collapse, everything was gonna have to be essentially um, improvised, which as we will see is what happened. Now, the, the uh, spearhead of the German forces, of course, were their Schnellertruppen. They had roughly a little less than three dozen tank and motorized divisions. Uh, I think to be exact, they started Barbarossa with 17 Panzer and 13 motorized divisions. Two of the Panzer divisions, which would make a total of 19, as I mentioned, were not committed because after the Balkan campaign, they needed replenishment. And, and these represented uh, about 20% of the attacking German force. The German force on the 22nd of June, the first echelon uh, along the main, uh, main uh, front of 1,200 kilometers of the three German army groups was 120 divisions. The vast majority of them, of course, 70 to 80 being um, uh, foot slogging divisions, which didn't move any faster than, than, than Alexander the Great's or, or Napoleon's forces. And as I said, um, they had this relatively di diminutive tip of the smear, spear, but if it failed, there was no plan B. The German military commanders or planners in their hubris had forgotten the injunction of the brilliant Feldmarschall Helmut von Moltke, chief of the German Gen Prussian general staff for 30 years in the late 1940s. And that is no battle plan survives initial contact with the enemy. They also failed to adequately account for what Clausewitz would call the friction of war, which among the factors Factors included the poor road and rail structure, 
which wasn't nearly as good as what they had encountered in, in, in France or the Low Countries. And that would slow and, and disrupt the, uh, the German advance. For, for instance, uh, the consumption of fuel was much greater than they had anticipated. And I believe the uh, oil that they needed for their filters and so forth, they ended up actually using that at a rate about 100 times what they thought because of the dust and, and other problems, about 100 times what they thought it was uh, going to be. Um, now, very quickly, just uh, as I mentioned, the Germans had, had 120 divisions in the first echelon, but they also had 28 divisions in the OKH or in the uh, Army Group uh, Reserves. They had about 3,500 tanks and assault guns. Uh, only 250 of those roughly were assault guns organized, if I recall correctly, into uh, 11 battalions and five independent companies. Um, and it, uh, think of it, they had 3,500 tanks and assault guns, which is precisely the amount of, of, of tanks that uh, Saddam Hussein had, uh, I believe, I don't remember, it was the first of the second Gulf War, but in one of those, uh, he had that many tanks himself. Um, as far as um, aircraft, they, they only, they had about 3,000 aircraft of which uh, just under 2,300 were actually operational on the 22nd of June. And these included, uh, which is kind of hard to believe, actually 200 fewer bombers than they had at the start of the French campaign. Now the Red Army for its part with its massive uh, buildup and it was, of course, was still in the middle of that buildup and force structure reorganization when the Germans struck. It had 5 million men organized into some 300 divisions, 171 of which, nearly 3,000 men, were stationed in, in, uh, on the um, Western Front in, in several different military districts. The, the Western Military District opposite Army Group Center, the Northwestern Military District, opposite German Army Group North, and the Kiev or Southwestern Military District, which was the largest by far. Uh, in fact, it included eight of, of Russia's 20 mechanized corps, uh, which faced Army Group South. Uh, also unknown to the Germans was that the Russians possessed some 20,000 tanks. And while most of these were uh, clearly outdated, superannuated models, uh, more than 1,500, in fact, 1,861 to be exact, were highly uh, capable uh, T-34s and KV-1s and 2s, about which the Germans knew virtually nothing. The problem here was that uh, those, those tanks, which if they had been well-organized, and if the, the tank commanders, the tank crews had been well-trained, would have posed an unbelievably difficult challenge right at the start of the invasion. But as, as matters turned out, uh, many of the uh, tank crews in those tanks had maybe no more than four or five hours experience when the war started. Some of the KVs, the KV-1s, at least which the Germans encountered uh, on 22nd of June in the sector of Army Group North, their main armament, their guns, had not even been bore sided. And, and um, I remember one case, I, I think this was Helmut Rittgen who pointed this out, that a bunch of these KV-1s overran uh, several German uh, 3.7 centimeter anti-tank guns, or door knockers as Germans called them, who, who, who couldn't do a thing against these, against these tanks, but the tanks never fired at them with their main armament. They simply overran them and crushed them. And later, when they were finally able to put out these tanks, I don't remember how they did that. Maybe they brought up some 88 millimeter guns or something like that uh, and looked inside the tanks. They saw that they actually had no shells because the, the uh, 
KV-1s because the main armament hadn't been uh, bore sighted. Now, one final comment and then I'll shut up. Was this a preemptive or a preventative war on the part of the Germans? I'd like to begin by bringing to attention a rather cantankerous debate which roiled the academic community for some time. Was Hitler's attack on Russia preemptive or preventive in nature? Preemptive war, and here I'm using the, 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 the uh, um, definitions by the historian Chris Bellamy, who 10 years ago so did a great book on Barbarossa. Uh, uh, he defined preemptive war as, quote, action to forestall or deflect a threat which is imminent and overwhelming. In other words, the threat is so serious, it's happening, the enemy is attacking, your only choice of action is either sit back and let them attack or preempt their attack with an attack of your own. And this concept actually enjoys a respectable pedigree in international law. Preventive war, on the other hand, is defined as, quote, acting to prevent a threat from materializing, which does not yet exist, unquote. And this concept has less legal favor. Was Hitler's attack preempted? Certainly not. For German records, and I've examined most of them, and things like the Halder's war diary and so forth, they make it entirely clear that they were not the least bit concerned. German intelligence wasn't concerned. Abwehr wasn't concerned about any imminent German attack in the summer of 1941. Now, was it preventive in nature? That is, was it coming maybe uh, months later or in 1942? Uh, surprisingly enough, one could, make, one could make a legitimate case for answering that in the affirmative. For new research, or at least it was some years back, into the Soviet archives by the Polish-born historian Brogdon Musial, and I'm referring to his book, uh, Kampfplatz Deutschland has confirmed through, through it, he really went through, the, did a deep dive into the Soviet archives and confirmed that Stalin himself was preparing to launch an attack on Germany in, in later in 42 or 1943. And I think, um, you know, that's no doubt a topic we'll get into. And there's a lot of evidence that that is indeed the case and that Hitler was either going to attack in 1941 or be attacked himself. But clearly, uh, there's no indication that uh, Russia was prepared to attack or going to attack, um, you know, just uh, weeks, uh, you know, that Hitler, Hitler's attack just preempted an, a Soviet attack by maybe several weeks. So in any case, um, I'll leave it at that. And uh, any questions, or, or we can just go on from there. Jim, you want to? All right, well, thank you. Uh, first of all, can Craig hear us now? Craig, can you hear us? Craig, can you hear the other state now? Uh, no. Uh, Jim, go ahead all right. Well, first of all, thank you so much. That was a terrific introduction and overview of this topic, which, again, we will go into greater depth in all these issues in weeks to come. But I have Thanks no. For that. I think I've lost my voice. I, I didn't know you were a singer. I hope you were singing a Rolling Stones song when you lost your voice. Anyway, well, I sang a few of those in my time. OK. <laughs> OK, good. Um, because actually I didn't realize we had something in common. I actually was a singer too as a kid. But anyway, uh, oh, so cool. the people, uh, you know, chime in before uh, uh, Craig and I do a duet. So, um, <laughs> and I questions. And yeah, I how do about a how about how about uh, wir fahren gegen England? Ah, yes, that would be a good a good one to sing. I I, I must admit I'm more familiar familiar with Johann Sebastian Bach. But anyway, okay. go, on, go on, Mark. Yeah, um, thanks very much for, uh, for everyone who's contributed. This is really awesome. I have a thanks. question that is uh, 
perhaps based on um, what one of the, some of the things that Alex had mentioned, but it's a, it's a more of an overall question regarding the German uh, planning for the first part of the war and their emphasis on the on ass assuming that they would capture all the rolling stock and all this railroad. They had gone through this 20 years before in 14 to 17, invading the same goddamn country. I'm wondering what, how that experience fed into their thinking in 1941. And I, and I can't imagine that they, they, they were able to capture all the rolling stock and all the railroads in, 19, in the First World War. Why would they think they'd be able to do that in World War II? Um, okay, uh, unfortunately, I'm having a, a little trouble hearing you on there. What what would the essence of your question? Could you just repeat it one more time, Mark? Sure. Uh, briefly, the Germans had invaded Russia at fourteen to seventeen, and they had experience in capturing you know some you know the rail the rails railroad and rail stock stock. But I'm sure they didn't capture everything. Why why make this optimistic uh, prediction or assumption in 1941? Well, I think first of all, um, you know, there had been, uh, a, a, as Williamson Murray and others have pointed out, a major revolution in military affairs between the wars, and and I'm talking about, uh, you know, things things that that that, that uh, technologies which were introduced in a rudimentary way in World War One, like the tank, uh, the wireless radio. Uh, um, uh, Air, air, aircraft uh, uh, in, 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 in ground attack roles and things like that. I, I believe that they felt, for one thing, that the internal com internal combustion engine completely uh, was a complete game changer. I mean, all of them had read uh, what, what Colin Court's uh, account of the Napoleonic campaign, and literally it was one 1,000 kilometers from, from um, the German-Soviet demarcation line uh, along the front of, of uh, Guderian's two panzer group or, or Kluge's fourth army, one, literally 1,000 kilometers in a straight line, of course, to Moscow. And they, they felt that, first of all, it, there's so many things going on here. The hubris that, that uh, was the result and, and that infected and corrupted German military culture after the fall of France. I mean, it's understandable, isn't it? These men had fought in World War I. Some of them had fought in the East, in the West. Many of them had been staff officers for almost four years and, and two million dead or whatever it was. They were unable to do what they were able to do with their, with their tanks and, and aircraft in simply 42 days in, in uh, June and July of 1940. And, and you look at all the victories they had in the first 19 months or so of the war from, from Poland, the Low Countries, uh, uh, Norway, uh, uh, France, and, and then the Balkans, they literally, as I think it was uh, General Blumentritt, who I believe at that time was on the staff of Fourth Army, I believe it was he who, who, who uh, um, issued a proclamation or something to his troops after the, the successful victory over Greece and, and Yugoslavia. And remember, it took them 11 days to defeat Yugoslavia, a little longer to beat uh, the, the Allied forces, you know, the Brits and so forth, and the Greeks who fought, uh, uh, you know, fought very, very uh, effectively. But, but he released a statement saying nothing is nothing is impossible for the German soldier, and that's that's part of it. This this hubris that they had, and then secondly, uh, what they had seen in the performance of the Red Army in Poland, and and then not being able to able to bring little tiny Finland to to to, to its knee until you know they'd lost something like two hundred and fifty thousand men or whatever it was, and, and six months of combat. And, and on top of that, of course, you, you, you have to understand the, 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 the racialist element, even racist element, that they, they simply felt that, 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 that they were 
and as superior people dealing against uh, uh, a group of people who just weren't prepared, uh, you know, collectively given their racial stock to, to deal effectively with uh, a, a German uh, attack. And then on top of that, add into that the, the effect of the purges where the, the, the Stalin literally decapitated almost his entire military leadership. And, and, and you throw all that into the calculus and, and I think you can see why they felt that um, it would be uh, an easy campaign. Now, now, literally hours after the campaign began, um, uh, General Paulus, and I got to always cross, stop myself from saying Fun Paulus because he was not a Fun Paulus. General Paulus had been serving uh, Halder uh, as mm -hmm. his General Quartermeister Eins, his, his chief quartermaster, and he had also made um, <clears throat> changes after, after General Marx did, put sort of the finishing touches on the Barbarossa campaign. And this is, I don't wanna to yak too long here, but this is kind of a fascinating story. Of course, this was top secret, but every night, uh, um, uh, Paulus, he and, and, and Halder and their families, they became very good friends, but they would be down in, in their office at the general staff on the Bendlerstrasse, wherever it was. Every night he would bring a briefcase home with, with his work in it. Well, his wife got, of course, got uh, uh, started to sniff out what was going on, and and she she was her her attitude essentially was, oh my effing god, you're planning a campaign against Russia? Are you people nuts? And she would argue with with her husband about it, and he would say, I am a soldier. It's not up for me to determine the you know politically what we do or don't do. But uh, so that's kind of an interesting aside. And both of, um, of Paulus's sons were, were, were lieutenants in the German army. But just after Barbarossa was launched, Paulus came into the headquarters and, and the head of the German army, Field Marshal von Wralkisch, asked him, General Paulus, what's your impression? How long do you think this campaign is going to take? Eight to 10 weeks, Herr General. And Brokic responded, yes, that's exactly my thinking. So that's my comment. Thank you. We still there? Mm -hmm. Some, yeah. Somebody else want to rate it now? Come on, come on, Frank. I know you got a question or two. Did that come through okay, folks? Yes, yeah, yeah, we heard, we heard it's fine. Okay. I guess um, in the interim, as as a follow up to that question, and I, I I totally get what you were saying, Craig. I I I, I agree. It it just it's still, even in World War One, the Germans had some amount of road transport. They knew how bad the Russian roads were to the extent they even had them. It, it just seems it just seems kind of strange that they thought they could really rely on motorized transport to supplement the uh, the railroad as much as they they assume because they'd been through that even you know granted yeah granted it, new cars you know cars and trucks of 1941 are not the ones of 1917 but the roads are still as non-existent and as bad um as they were in 1917 well yeah, that they, uh, you know, another thing is a lot of the maps that they had, the German, that the Germans began the campaign with, were terrible maps. A lot of them, and in, in different accounts uh, from officers and, and, and rank and file, I hear this all, the, read this all the time. They, they were inaccurate. And, and they would show in a bright, you know, red line, a road is a major road. That would just turn out to be a, a little pista, as the Germans call it, a, a little a little dirt road, and and so yes, they they had to uh, they they had to to deal with that problem, 
and and that's again a problem of the friction of war and and it created uh created a a huge um a, a huge issue for them and there was darn there was something else i wanted to to point out about that but i i can't think of what it was right now but if i do i'll i'll, I'll mention it um mention it in, in a minute. All right, anybody else have questions or comment? Go on, DZ. Hey, uh, Craig, you might also mention, I, I think you had referred to the uh, the ponies and the horses and the uh, inability for a lot of the horses to adapt, maybe. Oh, oh yeah, they, an average German infantry division had four, five, 6,000 horses, okay? And they did all kinds of things. Uh, but one of the main things they did was they pulled the artillery. And and uh, some of the artillery, like their Schwerwefeldhaubitzen uh, uh, Oxane, or their medium field howitzer 18, which was a 150 millimeter gun, very heavy weapon. It had to be split in, in, into two parts in order to be moved by the horses, but the, the horses were heavy, heavier horses than what you found in Russia. They were, they were heavy uh, Western European stock and they had a horrible time on, on you know, during that very hot summer, their, their uh, legs would, would, would sink down deep in, into the sand in these, in these, um, horrible roadways and what the Germans eventually did now they couldn't do this for the artillery because they weren't strong enough but they eventually transitioned to to the much hardier but much smaller uh Russia Panya horses to to carry as much uh thing uh, as as much of their equipment and their kit as as they possibly could but it, it, it's a terribly sad story because, because these, these horses suffered um, terribly and, and they began the campaign with, with about an equal number of, of motorized vehicles and horses. They had about, I think about 625,000 uh, uh, motor vehicles of all types. I mean, as Alex laid that out, I mean, it was just a logistical nightmare. Uh, much, much worse than what the Ukrainians now are trying to deal with, with, with um, you know, getting spare parts and maintenance for all the different pieces of NATO equipment they have. Um, the Army Group Center had something like one million different spare parts. I mean, I would not have wanted to have been a logistical officer in the German Army at that time. It would have been uh, just, just terrible. But, but the, the German high command, one other little anecdote here, uh, in, in, in earlier or mid-July, when, when Hitler was already looking beyond the Eastern campaign, because it was done, it was over. You know, they, they had encircled a German force, Russian forces at Minsk, Velostok, Minsk, and now another major encirclement at Smolensk. So they thought that they had destroyed the bulk of the Red Army so Hitler was looking beyond that uh, to you know, his eventual confrontation with Anglo-American forces. And on the 15th of June, I believe, he issued a, a, a Führerweisung, a, a directive shifting the, 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 the Schwerpunkt, the focus of German armaments away from the army to the uh, Air Force and, and the Luftwaffe. But at the same time he was doing that, there was a German officer, I think it was Helmut Stief, serving with the Fourth Army. He would later be executed for the plot against Hitler, who was writing to his wife about how the roads are so bad, we can't move more than one kilometer an hour. And Hitler already had uh, 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 raiding, mechanized raiding parties, uh, uh, planning for mechanized raiding parties to advance into the Urals if necessary. That is the disconnect that existed between uh, Hitler and his high command at the Volkshansa, his uh, headquarters in East Prussia, 
and, and what was actually happening at the front. All right, other questions or comments? Jeez, considering who's here today, I'm sort of surprised. The guys I know. Uh, go on, Alex. Right, I great. think I probably, uh, probably consumed enough of this uh, conversation. If someone else wants to take over, it's fine with me. No, you're doing fine. You, go on. you can keep going, Craig. Yeah. Um, what was yeah, well, I, I'm not here. The big anybody. questions that always gets la asked, which is, um, in your opinion, how much is is Hitler to blame for the mistakes, or how much is it a shared thing with um, the army staff and yeah, the the Wehrmacht as a whole? Because of course, there's you know the after the it war, is. of course, everybody said it's all Hitler's fault. You know, we we advised him not to do this. He made you know these five errors at key points in in forty one, and he's the reason we lost. Um, but of course, are they, you know, more nuanced and, you know, more of the contemporary, you know, looking back has kind of, you know, pointed out the German, yeah, like you said, the planning was wrong itself, had crazy assumptions, and that, you know, the, the German generals themselves often went along with um, Hitler's, you know, yeah. even, well, even well, when they disagreed. So I wonder, oh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm just chafing at the bit to answer that question. That's such a good question. And, and, and let me begin. Am I am I coming through okay? Okay. Uh, let me begin by saying Hitler. After the first few weeks, essentially, he micromanaged the Eastern Campaign, and it just got worse as time went on. Where Stalin, he micromanaged it too initially, at least through the the horrific counteroffensive that he made in the Kharkov region in early 1942, which was an unmitigated disaster where the Germans captured another 250,000 Red Army prisoners or so. But Stalin learned from his mistakes. And by, you know, by, by the latter part of the war, he was listening to his generals and essentially letting them run the, 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 the operations. Hitler went in the other direction. In fact, I've lost, I, I'm, most of my material is pretty well organized, but I lost this document. I cannot find it anywhere, but it's just unbelievable. Uh, during the winter of 1941-42, after uh, Feldmarschall von Bach had left, he had stomach problems, he uh, resigned or was relieved on the 19th of this December, by General Feldmarschall von Kluge as the head of Army Group Center. Well, Hitler would call him for hours at a time and, and von Kluge would have to babysit him for two or three hours a day. And um, there was actually um, uh, German officers who, th th this would go over a loudspeaker and they could actually listen to these conversations. And I can't think of his name right now, but one of these gentlemen who I actually contacted shortly before he died, he wrote a book called Valkyra about the, the, the 20 July 44 plot. And he was the last significant member of that plot to die. In fact, uh, uh, it happened maybe a couple of years after he sent me some information on, on von Kluge and other things. And I actually saw it scrolling along the bottom of Fox News that he had passed away and uh, shit, I'm looking for the book. I can't find it here. But anyway, my, my point is uh, uh, von Kluge would have to, to, to listen to Hitler go on for hours. And one point on New Year, I believe it was New Year's Eve, they, Hitler, and Kluge argued for three hours, uh, roughly, over the placement of several machine guns in a cemetery. I'm not making that up. That's absolutely true. On the other hand, the generals, the generals bear a significant responsibility in this because they never had the courage ultimately 
to stand up to Hitler. Um, and so in some ways it's an easy question to ask. In other ways, it's more, uh, it, it's a little more complex because you will recall in from, from about mid-July until late August for about a six week period, Hitler argued with his generals over the next phase of the campaign. They had failed to completely trap and destroy the Red Army west of the, of the on, in the frontier battles. Um, they had moved beyond Smolensk, but the Russians were still fighting. The state hadn't collapsed. The Russians were putting new divisions into the field constantly. And, and the German generals, of course, they wanted to continue almost to a man they wanted to continue the advance toward Moscow because they felt that, well, the, the, the Russians, for all sorts of reasons, need to defend their cap capital. So they will concentrate their primary forces in front of Moscow, and so we'll be able to destroy them there. Hitler, on the other hand, as I pointed out earlier, was not looking toward Moscow. Maybe he just had a bad feeling in the pit of his stomach because of what happened to Napoleon. But he wanted to turn... With, with his armored forces, uh, the two armored groups that were attached to Army Group Center, he wanted to send most of Hoth's fourth panzer group north toward Leningrad and Guderian's two panzer group south into the Ukraine. Now that made sense from a lot of operational regions, uh, reasons, because particularly on the southern flank, the Germans were having a lot of problems, particularly Army Group Center was, particularly with the Soviet Fifth Army. And what Hitler wanted to do was to clear both his flanks in the north, on the northern and southern wings before continuing the advance on Moscow. He also, at that point, by mid-August, the front, if you look at a map of the front at that time, it, there was a big bulge out toward Moscow then it, it receded to the southwest uh, in, in the Ukraine. And, and, and in other words, there was, a, there was a big salient in the Ukraine that, that, that projected into the German lines and, and, and was just made to order for a, 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 another German uh, Einkreisungs, a Vernichtungsschlag, uh, an encirclement battle of annihilation with Guderian coming down from the north and Kleist's first panzer group attacking from the south because uh, Stalin refused to let his forces pull out of the Kiev area and pull back as they should have done. So they just sat in this developing trap. Well, you know what happened after that um, by, by the middle of September, the Germans had trapped uh, all of all of um, Kirponis's um, uh, forces in the Ukraine uh, in, in, in a huge cauldron destroyed something like 55 Soviet divisions and took over 650,000 prisoners. So so Hitler felt completely vindicated by insisting on on doing that, and it's also I think pretty clear. That that at the end of, of in, in, by the a, a, at the end of the the campaign against Smolensk, the second big encirclement battle, the German armored forces and to a certain extent the infantry were just worn out, and 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 they had outrun their supply lines. They needed weeks to to prepare, uh, and to build up their supplies of of, of artillery shells and so forth. The tanks needed engines uh, before they could even begin to begin to seriously move on Moscow. And I think uh, getting back to what you were talking about logistics, Alex, I think von Krefeld in his book on logistics pointed out that despite all the back and forth and the disagreements between Hitler and his high command, due to the logistical issues that the Germans would have you know, they launched Typhoon, the attack on Moscow on the 2nd of October. But according to von Krefeld, due to their problems in, in the logistical buildup for the campaign, 
the earliest they would have been able to have launched it would have been a week earlier. They could have never launched it like in the, in the middle of August or anything because they would have never been ready. So I don't know if that answers your question, but but at least uh, oh, that, that uh, a part of it. Yeah. Um, all right, let me throw something in there. Uh, that is the issue of Hitler and how we understand Hitler. Now, all of us are well familiar with the biographies of Hitler after the Second World War. Uh, there, and of course, uh, sort of tropes that have occurred in those biographies. Certainly, we understand Hitler differently now through uh, Ian Kershaw's biographies. I think there's another biography, two volumes came out recently by a German author. I haven't looked at them yet. But it's very different than how we understand, let's say, on Alan, Alan Bullock's history, which is uh, good for the time period. But one thing that we did not have a clear grasp on is essentially how deliberate Franz Halder and his colleagues in the German senior command were essentially out to fake out the allies as to how and who was responsible for the debacles in the Second World War. Um, there is scholarship that is done in the past 20 years talking about how uh, Halder uh, basically was recorded laughing about how they were pulling the wool over the allies' eyes when he organized the entire process and dominated the uh, command histories, the lessons learned histories that were being done in the 40s. Uh, and they were particularly pleased that they manipulated B.H. Little Hart. Uh, now, that's not dealt with in John Mearsheimer's uh, dissertation. John Mearsheimer's dissertation at Cornell was on Little Hart. But uh, we now have, uh, and, and I'll track down the historian who wrote this because I think it was an article in Journal of Military History a couple of years ago. It was quite insightful. But um, the sort of image that everything should be laid at Hitler's doorstep was firmly established for a whole variety of reasons politically after the war by Halder because basically they wanted to avoid having to be held responsible for some of the you know tremendous atrocities that they had committed during the war itself. So, um, and we'll get into that as we go on because that I think is something to flush out and explore in greater depth. But Ted, go on. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ted. Go on. Fine. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I don't I want have much much to add here, but I, I was just wanted to, uh, at this at this moment we all know that when um, the battle for the uh, typhoon operation and ends up a, disa a disaster at Moscow, um, one of the most commonly uh, discussed fa factors are all the troops from the Far East, you know, the so so called Rush Asian so soldiers show up in front of Moscow and and save uh, the city. Uh, because the Japanese didn't attack uh, in the Far East. That's a point that comes up all the time. It certainly comes up in the discussions about whether Japan made the wrong choice in not joining the war in 1941, uh, but going south instead. And this is a subject that I have to deal with all the time in, in uh, talking about Japan. But I was just curious if it was, if I mean, it's a, a retro, retrospective, a retroactive thing. We know that the Germans ignored the Japanese completely when they made this Hitler Stalin pact in 1939 and 40. And we know that there was essentially a, a contempt for the Japanese on both sides, and for the Japanese to the Germans, uh, because they didn't trust, no longer trusted one another, uh, um, because of the betrayal of the Japanese grand strategic plan, uh, which was going to have a triple alliance of, of Germany, Japan, and um, the Soviet Union to fend off everybody else. And that was the, that was what they were thinking of in the spring of 1941. But I was curious in the in this operational planning for the for the uh, uh, actual attack in 1941, June, uh, I'm, I'm under, under the impression that there were many, many calls to the Japanese to join the war uh, soon thereafter. But I wondered if in the planning, there was any sense that they were you know, I'm not as optimistic as you've been saying they, they, have, they were, that they, if they saw themselves as winning this battle without uh, having to worry about what, what the Japanese or anybody else did, and the Soviet Union was going to collapse, and that was going to be the end of it. I was wondering what 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 you thought about that with the Japanese factor in the actual operational planning for the for the battle. Was there any sense that uh, if they didn't act quickly, uh, this well, I know that's the case, but I know that there, there was a factor that they, they knew they had to win early in the in the battle. I was wondering how if the Japan ever came up in this subject. That's all I meant. Thank you. 
I'm I'm sorry. Who is that question to me, or who is that to? Yeah, that's you, Craig. Oh, okay. Yeah, to you, Craig. Um, Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, I, I I made a little change here so I could hear you guys better. Am I coming through? Okay. Can Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can we can hear you fine, Craig. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry to keep asking that, but it's just uh, pretty. I'm I'm flying by the seat of my pants at my end here. Um, I, I don't think, yeah, you know, the, 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 you, you had the Axis powers, right? You had the, the tripartite pact, when was that signed? Sometime in 1940 or whatever, between, uh, Hitler of Germany and, 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 uh, Japan mm -hmm. and, and Italy. And then there were other countries that, that later signed on, but, but there was never any, and any kind of, of, of significant cooperation between uh, Japan and Germany and, and that would be remotely similar to what the, the, the Anglo-Americans had with their combined chiefs of staff and so forth. And, and you all know that. But I will, um, there, there was of course this huge debate between the Japanese Navy and, and, and the army. And I was just reading a little bit about that in this great book by Richard Frank, A Tower oh, of Skulls. And, um, you know, do, do we, do we uh, attack into Manchuria? Do we join a Hitler's campaign against Russia? Or do we move out in, into the Dutch East Indies and the Pacific and so forth? And of course the army represented the former, the Navy, the, the latter view. I understand that. But yeah. um, Andreas Hillgruber, again, getting back to him, he wrote an article about the impact of uh, the Battle of Smolensk on, on the Japanese, or, or at least that was um, oh, a, a very important part of the article. And he made clear that, and it is very clear, that, that the German advance up until about the middle of July, they were at least their spearheads, you know, like Hoth, Guderian, Hoffner, they were advancing at a rate of about 20 kilometers a day, if you average it out. After 15 July, it slowed down to four or five kilometers a day, and they got stuck again at Smolensk in an encirclement battle that took them like three weeks to bring to an end. Well, the Japanese interpreted this, and I think they were correct, as kind of a, the collapse of the German momentum of, 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 of their campaign in the East. And according to Hillgruber, in any case, mm -hmm. um, that played a significant part in the Japanese decision to do what they did, to, to move out, you know, into the, into the Pacific That's region, mm -hmm. Dutch East Indies to get the, 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 the oil and, and the other uh, minerals that they needed and not to, to join the, uh, the Eastern campaign. Well, that, that's very interesting. I, don't, I, I haven't seen that Hillgruber article. I, like, I certainly like to see it because I haven't seen that sort uh, that, uh, that information from anywhere else. I, certainly, yeah. Yeah, I, I do know that the Japanese followed the events of the Germans very uh, carefully and, uh, and they, they were uh, but but by that point they'd already made their decision not to join in. I'm I believe the, the the whole concept of the debate that there was really an, the much of the Manchurian operation uh, the Manchurian planning uh, was uh, misdirection. I, mean, I, oh. I would argue, but that's okay. whole, all of the questions. Uh, but but that's interesting. I I would love to see the citation for that, or if you if you ever had the Hillgruber article, you know what that yeah. was or when it was. Yeah, if you can share that article, I would uh, it'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah I um. Drats, I uh, let me let me check. I, I <laughs> Not think... this moment, if you don't have to right now, it's okay. But I would appreciate it if you could send it along to us. Or okay. this, if you have it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. And I've thanks never seen. For... I've never seen that. Thank you. Thanks for rem reminding me of that, and I will. I will definitely. But one, one of my interviews when do I was that. doing my Japan, my study on my Japanese, the Japanese officer corps was with. Uh, uh, was was with the young Japanese. Uh, then then he was a. a I guess a, maybe he might have been a lieutenant colonel. He might have been a, a full colonel at that time. Uh, uh, 
who was with the Guderian at the at the point where they reached as close as Moscow. There's a famous photograph of it. And I interviewed I interviewed that that gentleman. And so he was with them oh. right, right along there as an, as an observer. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He's that's that's uh, the grandson of uh, uh, Saigo Sugumichi, the grand the uh, the brother of Saigo Takamori, who led the revolution against the, the Meiji Restoration in 1877. His brother wow. uh, and, and, uh, was uh, stayed loyal, and this is the son of that man, who led it after the war became an intelligence um, source for, Jap for Japan and the United States after the war. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, okay. I think it's interesting about what that line of discussion uh, brings to mind is, and both myself, I'm not that impressed with a lot of a lot of what Richard did in that book is a, syn a synthesis of a lot of what's been out there in the scholarship of the uh, war in Asia now for 50 to 60 years at least. So, uh, for example, uh, what's that series that James Morley was in ch uh, charge of translating, uh, Ted? Oh, yeah, that, the uh, Taigeo Senso and Omichi. Greater yeah. East Asia War. That, that, yeah, and I, I did reviews of a couple of those way back when I was a graduate student when they first came out. I mean, with right. Jim right. Morley. Well, to write them, yeah. Right. What we're referring to is uh, James Morley was a, a professor at Columbia University. Uh, he'd been an intelligence officer in the Second World War, and he oversaw the translation of that particular series that was published, I believe, in the early 1960s, right? That's, that's, that's correct. I think there was six volumes, eight volumes. I can't remember, six or eight right. volumes. Right, uh, and it came out in several different versions in Japanese, and we uh, it, they translated all those volumes that were separate, given to different scholars to translate. Some did much better than others. Uh, the one that Jim did, of course, was great. But... Right, one of them is just devoted on the issue of Germany. Yeah, and it says to me in us thinking out about this is that I'd like to look for who's doing new work on that subject, because the whole interrelationship of the events in Asia to the events in Europe, uh, anybody who reads any discussions about America's road to Pearl Harbor, I think of uh, uh, all the different histories that have been written about that subject. It's always interrelated to how they're perceiving the ability of the Soviets, particularly after June 22nd, in surviving. And uh, as we know, uh, most Americans, I mean, that's one of the reasons why Harry Hopkins is sent by Roosevelt to uh, the Soviet Union to see what's going on. Most American, at least the military, they figured they were going to collapse. And, um, and so this is a very interesting topic to further get on top of and look at freshly what would be an interesting way to think aloud about this. Uh, it shows you how the problem of operational military history essentially being denigrated in the academy uh, is something as a problem because, you know, if it wasn't, we'd have a lot of interesting work being done on this subject. Yeah, yeah. Would eliminate. And so, it's, just, so it's, just a, it's, it's one of the big issues. We need a lot more bodies on this problem. I've always had, I mean, it's one, I, 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 I don't do, I, can't, I do a little bit in, in this corner, in the corner of it. I just right. wanted to mention Gerhard Krebs, the German historian. Uh, and I'm holding it as I abandoned my bookstelves to pull off his, his uh, Japan and the Pacific War. Uh, he, he's written greatly about the German-Japanese relationship. And most of them are still in German, but uh, it's Gerhard Krebs, K-R-E-B-S. And uh, he's the, probably the source, the best source on German-Japanese relations during the war. Well, uh, so I recommend there, him to anyone. And there's another German scholar who did an uh, amazing book about India and Axis strategy. That was oh. Hausner. Now that book is published in the seventies. This gentleman's probably interesting, but the question of how India was perceived by the Germans and the Japanese and their lack of coordination strategically, because obviously to take and seize India and threaten it was something the Allies certainly perceived. When you look at how the, if you read how the Imperial General Staff and the Americans are thinking about Asia. They are very concerned, especially in 1942, about the possibility of a linkage between the Japanese and the Germans. So. Um...